A Remembrance Day atrocity in Northern Ireland. A bomb has killed 11 and injured more than 60. As the story of the bomb dominated both national and international headlines, the scale and nature of the tragedy provoked fears about what was to follow. It could have started a civil war. Here was something which was intruding, a malevolent intrusion, right into the centre of that which was held in, in deep regard by people. A dreadfully familiar sight in so many of Northern Ireland's towns and villages, but never in the very moments when people were meant to stand in silence, mourning the millions who died in the battle. Irish people who have already lost so many had themselves become a target on the day they remember their dead. Every civilised country honours and respects their dead. And every civilised country expects others to honour their dead too. And to take advantage of those people assembling in that way was really a desecration. In a statement, the IRA admitted responsibility for the bomb, but insisted it had been a mistake. Their target, they said, was not civilians, but members of the Crown forces. I think on that particular occasion, the way their, their support base goes, uh, the IRA is a very small secretive organisation, but they do need to have a certain level of support, not just in terms of raising money, but uh, a certain level of emotional and psychological support as well. Um, and they realised very, very quickly that they had done themselves an awful lot of damage. The fact that it was something which had caused widespread revulsion was reflected in the IRA's own response the following day. They issued a statement saying, we deeply regret what has occurred. And in the fact that a very prominent Republican, such as Jerry Adams, the most prominent member of the movement, uh, within a short time had said that while he saw the IRA as freedom fighters, he considered that they'd carried out a terrible mistake at Enniskillen and that they must not repeat that mistake. So responses even from the Republican movement themselves demonstrated the degree of revulsion which this particular attack had occasioned. In Enniskillen, anger over the bomb was focused on Paul Corrigan, the Sinn Féin chairman of Fermanagh District Council, who had arrived to attend a meeting in the town hall the day after the bomb. There were a number of occasions in the days after the Sunday where you would describe the atmosphere as, as, as very tense, very electric, and that meeting was one. All ten Unionist councillors stayed away, leaving the rest of the council, including Chairman Paul Corrigan of Sinn Féin, in a delicate position. Sinn Féin came under tremendous pressure. People said to them, how can you possibly present yourselves as people fighting a legitimate campaign if this is the kind of atrocity you're going to practice? How can you possibly expect people to treat you as a normal political party if you're in a movement with people who are going to blow up civilians at a religious service? Everybody had fears, yes, we had fears. As a member, a representative of the national community, let me tell you, it was extremely difficult for me and my colleagues uh, particularly in SDLP, to walk into that chamber uh, that day and, and face my unionist colleagues, you know. Why do we look at things now that, um, you know, the Republican and other parties have a fairly slick um, PR machine? At that particular time, it wasn't as sophisticated. The IRA have accepted responsibility and have expressed their deepest regret at the catastrophic effects of this action. Suddenly, the press had someone to focus on and Unfortunately for Paul Corrigan, he was the public face of what had gone wrong, and he almost got the blame for it all. Mr Ferguson has branded you one of the guilty men. How do you feel about that? Have you anything to say about that? Do you mind? Are you going to say I have, anything I have no, more I have than no, yesterday? I have no comment. As the political tension continued to rise, Within the nationalist community in Enniskillen, there was also a deepening sense of unease. The, the, the Catholic community would have felt that the bomb had come from their side of the community, and they felt some way a, a sense of responsibility. It was dismay, and um, being uh, representing the nationalist 
population, a sense of shame because this was allegedly done in the name of the nationalist community. There was an anxiety about the, um, uh, what the impact of the tragedy would be for, for the Catholic community. And I think it's fair to say that many Catholic people were very frightened and concerned. My own view now and at the time was that this was a very, very worrying moment in our history. But that same day, a television interview with Gordon Wilson, the father of its youngest victim, was to have a dramatic impact on the mood and atmosphere within Enniskillen and beyond. I was bleeding from the forehead. You had hurt myself. But I was as assured that she was all right. She told me twice. She told me again, but she still was screaming in between times, and I couldn't understand why on the one hand she was telling me she was all right, and the other hand she was screaming. When I asked her for the fourth or fifth time, she said, Daddy, I love you very much. Those were the last words she spoke. I should never forget them. But I bear, will, I bear no ill will to anybody, nor does my wife. I think they must represent some of the most important and moving words that were ever spoken in the history of our troubles. Um, I bear no ill will to anybody. I was told later that there were people in Northern Ireland ready to take up uh, arms or whatever you like to call it and go out and commit murder in revenge for the Enniskillen bomb. And when Gordon said that, they couldn't do it. When I heard it, I thought, that's typical of the man. That, that's his reaction. He didn't bear any ill will. He, he always felt there were faults on both sides, and um, it was very true that uh, any uh, destructive language he would use or any ill thoughts he would have would only make the situation worse. And I think Mary's last words of love to him had sunk in so deeply and touched him so much that he couldn't bear for any um, repercussions or backlash. I think Gordon Wilson is very courageous and brave to say those things. No matter what you think, uh, I think it stopped probably other people getting killed because of it. Suddenly, a beacon of light had come into the darkness. The suddenly, uh, somebody talked about the world stopping. The world stopped to listen. And I have no doubt that Gordon Wilson's words gave new heart to people. For the greater world watching on, and particularly the world within Northern Ireland, it brought us all up short. It made us realize that um, the way we were living was not the way we should be living. But Gordon Wilson's words had also created some unease in the town. Not everyone felt that they could identify with his message. He was quite articulate, was Gordon. He was able to say probably the things that people like to hear being said. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't, that he didn't mean that from within himself, but he was saying things which, were, which sounded good to the outside world. Uh, but to a lot of people in the skill, they were disappointed because they didn't feel the same way. He came under very severe criticism. Uh, we were in no doubt about that. There were some very severe letters came here, uh, which affected me greatly because I, I just found it very difficult, very hurtful. He actually, to me, saved us from a lot of media attention, because at that stage, I didn't know what to say, what to think. And one of the things that my husband said to me over and over again, you'd be better saying nothing, because you don't want to say something you will regret, maybe in the years to come. What he said caused discord, for some people emotionally, um, 
how could he say that about his daughter, about the people who had killed his daughter? I think part of the problem was also that the media modulated what he said, all right? So uh, what happened was he said, I bear them no ill will, and that becomes the man who forgave the, the killers of his daughter. And I think that was unfair. Um, I don't think, I think that was too big of a leap. And you can understand it as a media shorthand, um, uh, but um, uh, it, it, that, that, that wasn't the right a, a conclusion for the media to reach about what Gordon had said, in my view. And, of course, people were reacting to what the media's interpretation was of what Gordon had said. Although not everyone had agreed with his words or how they'd been interpreted, Gordon Wilson's emotional interview had set the mood for the days that followed the bomb, as the people of Enniskillen began to bury their dead. Basically, there was only one thing to do in Enniskillen that week, and that was to reflect on and mourn for those who had died so tragically and unjustly. The town and the wider community dealt with the tragedy with the utmost dignity. And I think it was important for the town to do that. It was a conscious thing. I remember uh, the funerals uh, being different in two respects. One is that they were very, very large, but second, they were silent. Crowds of people making their way to funerals. In fact, at one stage, as far as I remember, one of the funerals actually going from the Methodist church actually crossed the path, passed by the Presbyterian church while the other funeral was going on. And we met each other. It was, it was almost like a great community act of mourning. One coffin was bad enough to see the second one driving off. It was horrendous. But um, out of that, you know, you could pick people's faces out of the crowd and I thought, oh gosh, they're so-and-so. Oh, they're so-and-so. And it's funny with the crowd of people that you could see friends. Then we went to the graveyard and we stood and we stood and we shook hands until it was dark. You know, at the end, you know, following the, the, the casket round to, you know, where my father was, was buried. And um, my, my, my brother suggested, you know, we might, you know, what do, how do you feel about, you know, unpinning the poppies and just putting them in, you know. And I just thought that was, you know, it's the four of us decided we would do that. So, you know, we got to the point and we unpinned our poppies and we sort of, you know, put them in into the, the grave and I remember sort of turning turning away and then and, and sort of moving to the side and talking to you but and I happened to turn around and I could see everybody was coming up and the whole congregation were coming up and dropping their poppies into the into the, and it was just you know it, it was just one of those moments again and it was, it was, again, one of those moments that you were just connecting with a whole group of people that you were just, you know... And it was something I think she would have, you know, liked that as well. I would liken the immediate aftermath to an ordinary family which suffered a sudden death. People come along to the funeral, offer their support, it's when those people go away and you're left in the quietness of your, of your home. It's then that you have to start picking up the pieces of your life again. Magnify that many times and you see what a community generally had to deal with. Television, radio, the world's press were here for two weeks. And the individual families had to deal with their grief in that sort of spotlight. Very, very quickly, everybody went away and Ennis Gillen and the families generally had to, uh, had to deal with that private grief. Um, I don't think there's any template for that. 
but certainly I think Enniskillen has dealt very well with that. For those who'd been injured, the weeks after the bomb saw the beginning of the long, slow road to recovery. The operation to, I wonder went an operation that evening, the evening of the explosion, which lasted about four and a half hours. They basically had to push all the bones out from the inside, out and uh, attach a wire frame or cage to the 